Okay, it's 2 p.m. Let's make a start. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to join us for this webinar on Chartership and Career Path. I'm your host today. My name is Suwei. For all attendees, please mute yourself. And for any questions and comments, please use, use the public chat room or privately message the co-host. Um, please send to Sethra, the second one in the participant list. And also the audio and presentations will be recorded and later published on our YouTube channel. This event is co-organized by the IEEE PES student branch chapter at the University of Manchester and also Seagree UK Next, Next Generation Network. So this is today's program. We will begin with a short introduction of the organizers. Then we'll have four talks to focus on the career path in academia and also IEEE fellowship will be covered. Then we'll have two guest speakers talking about the career path in the industry and then also the engineer chattership. First, let's welcome Dr. Chakrabarty to give us an introduction on Seagree UK NGN. Dr. Chakrabarty is currently the West Chair of Seagree UK NGN and he's a senior consultant with TNEI services. He's an electrical engineer with over eight years of experience in the power industry. He received his PhD degree from Imperial College London. He specialized in modeling and analysis of transmission and distribution networks and automation of system studies. And Doctor, I'll hand over the screen to you. Thanks, Siri. Um, I'll just put on my presentation. So, right, I hope all of you can see the presentation and it's just a, a, a brief introduction to what uh, the SIGRE UK Next Generation Network stands for and uh, uh, what we do as a team and what are the benefits of kind of uh, being part of this community. So UK, uh, SIGRE UK National Committee is the umbrella organization and um, C NGN is part of this um, national committee. We have got a separate steering committee with uh, different teams looking after different aspects of the committee. And this NGN, is a professional network for young engineers in the early career and also early career researchers in the in the academia. We have got a pretty big team. Um, each team member is tasked with uh, different aspects of it. So as I was saying that the, the structure of the team is divided into four groups. We have got the, uh, the communications team, the uh, events team, then we have got the um, the uh, the communications, the events, and then we have the the, the two other teams on uh, one is on marketing, and one is on uh, what's it called the membership. So as you can see, that our team has uh, a quite a varied background. We have got people coming from different companies. Um, in here, you can see Jingyi. Jingyi is our chair at the moment. And she's from Mount McDonald. Uh, we have uh, Julio here from you know, the University of, uh, uh, from the Imperial College. He is the communications lead at the moment. We have got Max. He is the supporting technical uh, from TNEI. Similarly, we have got other team members from, from different uh, universities. We have got Song, who is leading the membership team at the moment from Manchester University. And uh, we have Sharia from National Grid, who is the events lead at the moment. And uh, also we have got Shaolong here. He has been with uh, Sigrid Indian for a very long time. And uh, he has been in different roles. Um, lastly, he was the, the chair of uh, the Sigrid Indian steering committee. And now he has handed it over to Jingli um, uh, at the moment. So, Secret UK NGN was, it goes back quite a 
while it, it's, it was it's more than 10 years old it was set up in 2007 and uh, uh, it was uh, the first young member group of Seagrave Global and uh, I have been associated with this group for more than three years now and what I have seen that there is a very steady base of uh, active members with a very good proportion of representation from uh, academia and industry. There are definitely many benefits of joining the, uh, the NGM group. I mean, I think the most important ones are like you get, get to make new professional contacts in the power industry. And uh, also you get to develop many important skills such as working as a team, you're improving your communication skills and also your time management. And all these things helps you towards your personal and professional development. And if you're looking to apply for a chartership in the future, then this can definitely help you to tick some boxes. Apart from that, we definitely have got uh, some other uh, benefits like it's, uh, this membership is free for students, also for young professionals. This is uh, free for the first three years. Uh, we organize several events every year, so you get to participate in those events. And also you can get involved in CIGRE activities like the, the working groups. Uh, you can support the CIGRE national community um, study committee panels shadowing them and also you can join our steering committee and uh, be a member of that. For the past uh, 10 plus odd years I mean we have uh, held and organized various events and these events are kind of wide ranging I mean starting from visiting HPC substations to GIS substations to um, uh, uh, visiting cable ships or uh, doing um, technical presentations. So there are different events we have done. And uh, what we usually do is uh, we aim to organize these events across the whole GB, different places, so that even if you are not able to attend one of the events, there's gonna be another one uh, in a few months time, which might be closer to you and it's easier for you to join. So in that way, we keep in mind that when we are having events, it's kind of very, uh, well spread across the country. A few recent events what we had recently, one is um, it was a full day event. Um, the first half of the event had technical talks from experts and then in the afternoon we went to the um, to, to the site to have a visit at the, uh, the Nelson substation which is uh, kind of the, the site for the Phoenix project. Phoenix is a project which is looking at a hybrid solution combining a synchronous condensation and static condenser to address the challenge of uh, low, sync, uh, low inertia and low short circuit power in the future GB network. And for this event, I actually managed to squeeze time out of uh, my office time and attend this event. This was a very good event. Um, and you get to hear a lot from the experts and how they're actually doing the, the trial runs uh, uh, in the site. The next one was the careers and skills event. This is uh, to promote interest in um, young uh, secondary students and interest in empowered systems, raise the awareness of how this uh, low carbon uh, and decarbonization is taking place. Although I didn't find time to attend this, this one, but as you can see from the, the photos on the right hand side that um, that Jing Yi, Xiaolong and um, uh, Holio attended this one and they were they had a really splendid time there and uh, they interacted with some inquisitive minds. So it was a very fruitful event. Next we had the young member showcase. This is uh, something which happens every two years to align with the, uh, the secret Paris event and what we do is we shortlist candidates based on some abstract submissions and then we invite them to present their work here and the winners are given a free registration to the full secret Paris session and, and also to present their work in the panel discussions. So uh, this is also a very good platform to showcase your work if you're a PhD student or you're doing some research as a, as a postdoc then it's a good platform where you can present it. And we usually hold this um, even at the University of Manchester campus. So there is always, after this event, we visit the labs and different facilities, and you can see the, the photo on the right-hand side that uh, um, 
we have uh, mm, the picture of the high voltage lab. Next is the, the Paris session. This one is um, this one is the, is one of the most important event in um, for Segway. It happens every two years, and uh, uh, this one is a very big conference with uh, a very good attendance from industry as well as academia. And uh, from industry, you have, usually have exhibitions showing latest technologies and strides in the power industry, followed by panel discussions, uh, working group meetings. Uh, progress of working groups and presentations from that. Um, I'm pretty sure that many of you have already attended the CGA Paris session, but in case you haven't, I would definitely uh, say this is something is worth a visit. So coming up to the upcoming events now, we have two events coming up, which is actually pretty soon. It's both of them are this month. The first event is on career management and grid modernization for which we have uh, invited John McDonald. He's a distinguished member of Segre and IEEE Life Fellow. He's from G Grid Solutions and Renewable. Um, has extensive experience, uh, 46 years of experience in the industry. And uh, he's gonna share his knowledge on career management, career growth, and the modernization of the grid beyond smart grid. And for the second event, we have um, invited uh, Rob Stephen, he is the present president of Seagrid, and Adam Middleton, who is the chair of Seagrid UK. They're going to give uh, deliver two presentations on uh, the energy challenges we have facing in the UK and globally, and also opportunities for young members. Um, young members especially have a, a very big opportunity in this exciting field and how they can contribute to this decarbonization. And lastly, we're going to briefly touch upon the mentoring scheme. Uh, this was something was launched last year in September, and um, I, I participated when, the, uh, when it was first launched. It's a very good um, scheme, but then it took a bit of hiatus because of uh, the, the situation we are in now. But uh, we're going to relaunch the scheme this month again. And, uh, what this entails is every participant in this uh, mentoring scheme is assigned a mentor from one of the national study committees based on your interests and your, your field of expertise. And uh, it gives you a very good opportunity to discuss your, your career prospects, your career goals to get your mentor, and they can give you very valuable suggestions. Uh, drawing in from their uh, extensive experience from industry and um, so this is a, a very good um, a, a very good platform where you can kind of discuss with your uh, with your mentors how you're going to go for a chartership application or any other professional membership which you have to, which you're thinking of applying in the near future so i think that was all from my side uh, that's a quick a very quick introduction to what we do as an engine Thanks a lot for listening to the presentation. And uh, if you have any questions, please, please feel free to ask me or any of our team members. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor, for your introduction. I'll switch back to my screen now. Yep. Yeah. So now let's have a look at the IEEE Power and Energy Society Student Branch Chapter and what we do. And this will be given by me, myself. So my name is Wei Liu. I'm currently the chair of the Student Branch Chapter. I'm also a final year PhD student at the University of Manchester, focusing on lithium ion battery modeling and uh, grid applications for battery energy storage systems. I've been on the committee for three consecutive years. And the same as me, um, most of the, uh, the the committee members are young and passionate uh, researchers in the area of power and energy at the University of Manchester, uh, except the Jospin. We have Jospin for our uh, exter uh, external communication officer. She's located in Lancashire. Um, and also we have Dr. Robin Preece as our academic advisor. He's uh, sending a lecture at the university. 
Um, so our student branch chapter was established uh, in 2012 and all these years we organize so many events and we receive all these achievements and awards. Um, so a little bit, a little recap on our previous event. So this year we've organized the two events. One is the past day celebration webinar focusing on um, the history and the future of power and energy. We invited uh, guest speakers to uh, um, to give us a talk on the Power and Energy Society, which is the, actually the largest society under the big umbrella of IEEE. And also we also uh, had panel sessions and some technical questions are uh, asked and answered. And also we had our annual general meeting in February. Um, this is when we uh, elect the new committee. Every So we, we uh, change the committee every February. So if anyone would like to join us, keep an eye on our updates around that time. Last year, we held the seventh Manchester Energy and Electrical Power System Symposium, um, focusing on the, a journey towards a future power grid. So this is our largest event um, every year. Um, this symposium will uh, always have oral presentations and post presentations. And we also invite our uh, guest speakers to do keynote speech. And we also give awards to um, winners of the best presentation award. Um, last year, we have EA Technology, TNEI Services, and Electricity Northwest, and also the university as our sponsors. I have some photos here. So we, that's one of the highlights of the poster session. And also this is uh, a photo of the winners last year. So they can receive up to 200 pounds cash prize for being the best of present, uh, for having the best presentation. We're gonna help the event again, but this year we have to make it online due to the COVID-19 situation. But uh, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, cover the details later. And also last year, we held the third Women Engineering Workshop at the university, uh, which was focused on the challenges, support, and opportunities that uh, any um, um, female engineer might encounter in their uh, career path. So we invited distinguished uh, female engineers from academic and also the industry to give us talks based on their own experience, giving us tips and uh, advice and also we have a uh, welfare officer from the university came to talk about the uh, support that university can give us um, this event was post podcasted and uh, uh, it's uploaded to our youtube channel so if you want to watch it again um, please just visit our youtube channel page um, also, we organized a set visit last year to the digital factory of Siemens in Congleton. This, this was a free event uh, for all the students. Um, we hired a bus to take them to the factory and we had some hands-on experience. Uh, we had a tour in their lab and also the factory itself to see how their products are manufactured. We disassembled a lot of their products, um, so it was quite fun. We actually plan to do similar things again this year, but we have to put that on hold because the the lockdown. Um, but definitely in the future, if we have any opportunities, we will organize similar things again. Besides, we also have uh, lectures organized every year. Uh, last year we have seven lectures. We support the distinguished lecture. Uh, program of IEEE and also we have uh, four separate speakers come to give us technical talks and we also have social events we have store at the orientation week um, of the uh, of the university and also we have uh, social dinners or drinks within the committee so it's actually quite great to join us as a committee member here are some photos of the lectures we held from last year. 
Right, um, our next event, which is also our biggest annual event, is the ACE MIPS Symposium. Um, this year, since we have to make it online, we decided to make it a three half day uh, event. So the date has been confirmed to be 4th to the 6th November uh, this year from 2 to 5 p.m. every day. Um, the theme has been decided to be envisioning envisioning the power and energy systems in an industry 4.0 era. Um, basically, anything relates to applying the state of our technologies to the, the area of power and energy will be welcomed. Um, currently, we are calling for sponsorships. Um, so previously, we call for sponsors for the cost and also for the keynote speakers. Um, this year, we don't have uh, a large cost to claim back, but we do hope that we can name the awards uh, after our sponsors um, for the best presentations. So if anyone or uh, any companies are interested, please contact me. I left my email address here. Um, the abstract submission will start late this month. So if you want to showcase your own research work, if you are young researchers, you're a PhD student or MSc student uh, in the UK, um, you are all welcome to join us for this great symposium. Just follow us for the latest update. So all those uh, contact details will be repeated at the end of this webinar as well. So you can note it down. Okay, that's all about uh, us. Um, I hope that will be some in beneficial information. So let's um, start our um, main talks about career paths and chartership. Our first talk will be given by Professor Zhang. Professor Zhang is currently a chair in the electrical power system at the University of Birmingham. Um, He's, he has all these achievements and titles. I, I, had, I have to admit that a, uh, I had some difficulty to put them in all this, in all this, uh, um, all, them, all of them in, in this single slide. Uh, so, Professor, I do apologize if uh, I missed anything. Um, but the highlight is he was elected as the IEEE Fellow for his great contributions. And he's going to talk about the uh, actually fellowship in a bit and he's also a member of SIGRI, a fellow of IET and Chinese Society of Electrical Engineering as well. So Professor now I'll hand over the screen to you. Thank you. Now I want to share my screen. Yeah, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Uh, this is this is Xiao Ping Zhang from University of Birmingham. I'm very glad to join this event because I'm a member of SIGRI for many years. Also, I'm a fellow member of IEEE. So it's a really very exciting opportunity to doing this event and share my personal experience with um, young professional. I hope uh, my talk uh, going to uh, give uh, some sort of idea uh, what sort of career development opportunity um, will be with the IEEE at the Cigarette. Particularly, uh, my talk going to be focused on the opportunity from IEEE. Um, so this is, um, if you have not been to Birmingham University, probably uh, this does give you a little bit idea about Birmingham University. Welcome to read Birmingham University. My talk is going to be, first I want to give a very brief introduction to myself. 
not going to discuss a bit about uh, IEEE technical activities. Uh, that I will show you, share with you some examples, my personal experience in engagement with IEEE. Finally, hopefully, we got some time to have a Q and A. Question. To myself. Uh, first, from bottom, I got all my degree in electrical engineering, master degree, MSc degree, and a PhD degree. Then I um, went on to, to do engineering work as RD engineer and manager for SCAD and EMS system. So probably, uh, if you don't know what EMS is, it means any management system. And the SCAD system typically is a monitoring and control system for power grid. So I had that for five years. I moved on to um, visit UMIST. Then I also visit Technical University of Dortmund. Um, by taking up the Hongbao Fellowship. Then later on, I got the appointment as a lecturer uh, with University of Warwick, and subsequently appointed as the associate professor. And uh, later I moved to uh, the neighboring university, University of Birmingham, that later on became professor of electric power system, and also as uh, director of the smart grid. Uh, so uh, looking back my career, uh, my career development very much related to the IEEE at the SIGRI, these professional activities. I benefit a lot for these technical activities. Now I cover a little bit about the IEEE technical activities. So basically, IEEE is, um, as uh, SIGRI does, is very much a the global professional organization. Uh, at the moment, uh, IEEE Power and Energy Society uh, has a total members, total number of membership of uh, 40,000 in 150 countries. Uh, basically, the membership is split into 10 regions. Uh, our region is the region eight. So what you can say here is uh, in our region, we have uh, 48 chapters, 78 student chapters, and 5,800 members. And um, what you can see here is um, this um, society very much, the IEEE itself, is very much a global organization because we have uh, over 50% of the members are outside of US. Now, talking about the IEEE technical activities and engagement, of course, at first you need to, uh, to be a IEEE member. They, they, they have different sort of membership, student member, ordinary member, senior member, and a fellow member, also a life fellow member. Well, uh, IEEE have a different sorts of technical activities, including conference, um, standard committee, uh, working groups, uh, journal publications, and they, they also have a resource center, actually. Uh, for PS, also have a PS uh, University. So uh, if, if you, in the future, you have uh, uh, the plan to join industry, probably the IEEE standard development activities, you would have interest to look at. Uh, in fact, I, will, I think the, the percentage should be a little bit higher actually, uh, from 45 to 48% of the IEEE standard are created by IEEE Power and Energy Society. 
So this um, give you a sort of flavor of the IEEE PS resources. So you, you could explore this website, find more resources for yourself. Now some examples. So in fact, I attended the first IEEE conference in 1994. By chance actually, I, in that conference, I met this lady, um, Dr. Jessica Bien. She has just elected to be the president of IEEE-PS. In two years time, uh, she will be the former president at the moment. She has taken the position of uh, president-elect for IEEE-PS. In that conference, Dr. Bian gave a presentation about the new flexible AC transmission system device. That time is some, um, it is a fax basically power electronic devices. A fascinating device and uh, provide all sorts of uh, fast control capability for our grid. So inspired by her presentation in that conference, So this give you a flavor how important for you get involved in the IEEE activity for internet conference. You can learn a lot of new ideas, new solutions, and talk to a uh, lot of uh, experienced engineers about their personal experience. So this is the second international conference I attended. It happened in 1997. This, in fact, is the Sigri symbolic. I met a uh, well the top engineer in the world at that time, uh, Dr. Thomas Iliaco. He actually considered to be the father of modern energy control centers. Do you know for any power grid, you have a control center. So a lot of uh, early control center idea actually were created by himself. So it's a very fascinating opportunity to talk to these uh, talented senior engineers in these uh, distinguished conferences. Um, so that's my early appearance. Since then, actually, I get heavily involved in cigarette activity and IEEE activities. Later on, I have been heavily involved in the constant paper review, and that I got also the appearance of a conference session chair, and also uh, invited to join by some conference technical organizer committee, as committee members, conference com technical committee chairs, and so on. Um, also later on, I start the work of uh, IEEE working group. Basically this working group is talking about uh, different sort of uh, uh, technical challenges and opportunity for engines. Um, the technical working group, I have been involved is a test system for economic analysis. You know, most of you probably know IEEE standard 30 bus test system. Uh, but back to 10 years ago, we realized that sort of uh, system probably just uh, not enough because the system too small. So we created such a working group, get people together, create some large scale test system for the community. Uh, so typically you at the beginning could be a member of the working group. Um, that could be as um, secretary of the working group. And that, you know, later on, you could be a white chair and chair and so on, that you can pick up the leadership role gradually. Um, also, uh, if you go to the US um, annual, we, we call general general meeting, uh, we call IEEE PS general meeting. I think you got the opportunity to join the technical committee meeting Quite often, actually, subcommittee meeting because most of technical activity actually um, 
carry out within the sub community rather than a technical community. Technical community is a higher level. Of course, uh, the, a sub community must be within a certain technical community. I think within HLPS at the moment, we have over 20 technical committee. Within each technical committee, we have a few to several sub committee. So normally, you join a sub committee meeting that you can join some of the working group. Well, uh, basically, it's very easy to join. <coughs> uh, the IEEE keep the open door policy. It doesn't matter you are a student, you are a young staff member with industry, with university. Uh, as long as you are in the conference, you can open the door, join the meeting, put down your name and the email address. You immediately become working group member or subcommittee member. So it's easy. But in comparison, I think the secret activity is more formal. Uh, you need to get different level of approval before you uh, become, you know, the national representative or working group member. Of course, they, they have different sort of style. Uh, along you get some appearance, probably next step you uh, is a help with a review of technical papers submitted to the IEEE transactions. Then later on, you get more experience as reviewers. Uh, suppose your review performance has been very well, and uh, sometimes you got invitation to join the editorial board as associate editor or editor. So what it does actually, you help organize the review of the papers rather than the reviewers. So that means your technical leadership has been created. So in that arena, you, you can play more important role. You can uh, talk to more senior people more easily, actually. So that, that's an opportunity. Uh, in terms of uh, professional development, within the HBO, they have a different level of membership. I think student member, associate member, uh, member, senior member, uh, finally, fellow. Uh, fellow grade it probably is the most difficult grade you can achieve, actually. I think normally, every year, uh, they just elect something, um, one out of 1,000 people uh, to be a HIV fellow. Um, I, I think probably you also heard about the life fellow. Uh, life fellow because of age. I think uh, I remember that normally if you already I travel fellow, if your age is over 65, automatically you become life fellow. So life fellow is a fellow. So if you say somebody is life fellow, that means the person definitely is a fellow. That means a very senior fellow. Okay, because of age. So this uh, my my personal sort of appearance are uh, very positive. I go through my uh, career lander with the help I, of uh, HBA activities, conference activities, conference organization, uh, HBA journal editorial board activities, HBA working group activities, and uh, <clears throat> recent years also HBA standard. Uh, working group as well. Um, certainly, during the, during the process, you need to develop your unique research activities. For instance, I have been elected to IEEE Fellowship because my distinguished contribution to FACTS and IEEE Um So you must make yourself very distinguished in the particular area. The area could be very focused, not necessarily very broad. I think to be a fellow, I think it's probably very difficult if your research area is too broad, uh, that people probably believe you are not very focused. So therefore, they cannot see your uh, visibility or leadership. So sometimes maybe very focused research area uh, may be much easier to become a job fellow. Uh, reflect my research activity probably, uh, you know, 
uh, my early sort of career, my research area too broad. If I you know, narrow down my research activity properly, it could, could become a fellow uh, 10 years ago. Also, another thing is I was too busy because I did not have the chance to, uh, to think about it until recent years. So, okay, that, that's my personal story appearance. If you have any questions, you are welcome. Basically, we are working um, in a global village together. So in the future, if you need any help, let me know. So that's my email address or to my personal website. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for the sharing your own experience, Professor. Now let's, uh, let me collect the questions. So Professor, um, the first question is about uh, chartered engineers. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm sure that it, this will also be covered by other uh, engineers, uh, other speakers today as well. Um, the question is, is um, the chartered, is the, is the chartership valued in academia? Because um, I myself heard about it before, like uh, if, if you want to um, stay in academia, I, the, the chartered uh, the chartership seems not to be a key point, uh, a key thing that uh, will uh, uh, let you have an academic position. Is that a right thing? Correct? Um, I, 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 I think yes or no. Uh, but but uh, my personal sort of view is um, uh, even you, uh, your long term plan is um, to stay with. Uh, University, um, the chartered engineer is still very important because I my, myself also uh, talked to some of the very very senior uh, engineer in the country. Uh, they actually um, give my advice actually, also asking myself pass on advice to our students. The chartered engineer status is fundamentally important because that uh, give you a sort of indication of your appearance, your qualifications, your recognition. So that's a very, very important data. But of course, probably charting engineer is more important for engineer working with industry, of course. But in my view, equally important for university people as well. Okay, thank you very much for the answer. And also uh, another comment. So uh, it's very interesting to learn your own experience. Like uh, you have a uh, very long history with Zaytubli and Sigri uh, attending all these events from uh, last century. Um, I, I guess uh, some of our attendees today will say, okay, um, like 10 years after they will look back in their experience and say, uh, 10 years before I attended this webinar and learned from Professor Zhang and he inspired me about uh, how to start to work with Sigri and actually, because as you mentioned, um, there is no typical threshold to be a, a work group member. I think it's, it's the same for actually PASS or Sigri. Um, but at the same time, because um, it seems that there's quite a lot of opportunities. You can be paper reviewer, you can work as a um, work group member. So do we sh should we focus on something? Or your suggestion will be that to uh, just try everything and uh, seek every opportunity? Yeah, I, 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 I think that actually, uh, the things I mentioned at the beginning, uh, immediately if you are young, young students, research students, or young professional, if you have never, never involved in the activity of uh, IEEE before, probably you can start with a um, um, conference paper reviewer, maybe conference organization, uh, maybe working group members, 
So these, these things actually can be done in parallel. It's, it, it's really uh, all these things come together, not necessarily uh, take you a lot of time. Uh, for instance, working group activity maybe um, maybe during the year uh, a few teleconference and it's good to uh, go to US to join a annual meeting every year. If that's uh, difficult, but you still can join the one group meeting via the teleconference. And the conference reviewer actually that that you know, anywhere. If you 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 are willing, actually quite often you receive the invitation ask you to help the the, the paper review. I, I think I think that's a good start. And then build up your reputation. Actually, later on probably people approach you for journal paper review. And then you build up your reputation. Um, you, you have been doing very well, well in terms of performance for the journal paper review. The editorial board would like to invite you to join the editorial board. That's a process. Okay, thank you for your answer. Uh, let's have a, another quick question because we are kind of running late. So someone asked, uh, so this, uh, this person is a third year undergraduate and he would like you to comment on is there any advantage to do an MEng um, than do a BEng degree? MEng, um, yeah, depends. Depends. I think a different perspective. You, you know, I, in my view, if you could open up your sort of vision, um, uh, you you have actually different different options, other options as well. Um, BNG, MNG, also MSC course as well. Uh, my personal view is I, I prefer actually rather than MNG, I prefer MSC course because MSC course give you provide the opportunity um, to, to, to learn more advanced knowledge. Uh, but the MNG, of course, that's very much integrated with the BNG course. Of course, some universities probably they share the course between MNG and MSC. Um, but but it depends. I my personal view is um, MSC course even better than MNG. If you do want to do MNG, but of course you can talk to different people, look at the course structure. The important thing is whether the course structure, the syllabus is what you are looking for. Is that fundamentally important? Whether you are interested uh, to, to do the course. Of course, you have all, all, all other options as well. Uh, UK system, after you get your first degree, BNG degree, you can, um, you can, you can do PhD study immediately. That's another option. Okay, thank you for your answer. I hope this will be helpful for this, um, for whoever asked this question. Um, now let's move on. Thank you very much, Professor, for your uh, presentation. Now let's move on to our next talk, um, which will be given by Dr. Papadopoulos. Um, He's a senior lecturer in the Department of Electronic and Electrical Engineering at the University of Strathclyde. And he's also a Research and Innovation Future Leaders Fellow. Um, he received his PhD um, in 2014 and worked as a postdoc at the University of Manchester and later he joined the University of Strathclyde. He's currently the chair of the IEEE UK and Ireland section power and energy S society chapter committee. He's also an active member of IET and um, he's in a uh, research interested uh, in the area of power system suitability and dynamics. Um, doctor, I'll hand over the screen to you now. 
Thank you, CV, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. And thank you for the invitation as well. Let me share my screen. Right. Can you see my slides? Yes. Perfect. All right. Uh, so I uh, thought it would be. Uh, um, I thought I would start with my my own personal, let's say, career path. So give you a little bit of an overview of what I've done so far. Um, so I started my first degree in 2002. Uh, it was an electrical and computer engineering degree uh, from the um, Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in Greece. So this is something, it's a five-year engineering degree, something like an MN equivalent here in the UK. And then I continued right after that to do a PhD, same department, same university. And after I finished, I moved to the UK uh, as a postdoctoral research associate at the University of Manchester, where I spent uh, three years there. And finally, I moved to Glasgow to become a lecturer at the University of Strathclyde. And uh, in 2019, I was also awarded a Future Leaders Fellowship from UK Research and Innovation, which is effectively the research councils of the UK. Uh, this is a fellowship aimed at uh, early career researchers mainly, and gives you kind of a significant support for up to seven years um, effectively to, to realize your research vision. And very recently I became a senior lecturer as well. So you see that I kind of highlighted um, here in my screen the different uh, involvement I had with professional organizations as well um, during my, my, my career. Uh, I started as a student member from IET uh, when I was an undergraduate and then I became involved with IET as well during my PhD. And then uh, as a researcher in Manchester, I uh, started getting involved in the UK and Ireland uh, IEEE Power and Energy Society Committee as a member initially. And I was also involved in a secret working group. And then as a lecturer, I became the chapter chair of the IEEE PES uh, UK and Ireland Committee. And I'm also the advisor of the local uh, student branch uh, in Strathclyde. Um, I'm involved in several technical committees, as Professor Zhang mentioned, uh, and working groups and task forces of IEEE. And I'm also a member of a few groups in, in IET. Uh, and we are also in Strathclyde, we're a collective member of, we have a collective membership of SIGRI as well. Uh, so following this career path, I, I faced several uh, dilemmas. Uh, so this is by no means an exhaustive uh, list of possible career paths. It's just mostly motivated by my own career path, but I tried to kind of make a small schematic to, to, to show you the uh, questions I, I needed to answer throughout this. Uh, so after the university, you finish your first degree, the, there comes the question, now what do you do? Um, a lot of people go back to the university to do another uh, additional MSc course to, to gain uh, either deepen their specialization or probably slightly change the area and gain obviously more skills uh, and so on. Uh, but again, you still have to answer the question now what after you finish the MSc as well. So after that, you can potentially go to the industry where you have an array of, of, of possible uh, positions that you can apply for. There are even ded dedicated graduate schemes um, that uh, focus people that come out right out of the university in several companies. So you can work for utility companies, uh, technology vendors, consultancy companies, and so on. Uh, at this instant, I chose to continue uh, studying effectively. Uh, I, I continue to do a PhD, so I basically stayed in academia. Um, I think the most important thing you get out of this PhD is the fact that you become an independent researcher. This is what motivated me mostly. So you can basically uh, learn the state of the art uh, around the research area, pose meaningful research questions and give meaningful answers to those research questions. Uh, but still after that, now what? Um, uh, again, you can go back to academia or stay a little bit longer inside and do a postdoc. So work as a researcher at um, one a university in one research group. And then you can gain more specialization. Uh, again, a lot of people widen their research area at this uh, instance, get the chance to work in slightly different uh, research areas. Obviously you build more technical skills, but also soft skills as how you present, how you disseminate your work, how you defend your work and so on. And this is usually considered a kind of like a gateway to the academic career. But still, after that, you need to answer the now what question. 
and you can still go to the industry and uh, maybe now you have a bit more um, opportunities for different roles as well. So for example, research and development roles within companies, uh, or you can follow a formal uh, academic career path uh, after that. So, I mean, again, uh, I'd like to highlight that this by no means is, is a one-way process. So I know a lot of people that have finished their the, the first degree, uh, came out of the university, worked for the industry for a few years, then did a PhD and then uh, had a full academic career or vice versa. Some people followed the academic career path and then at some point they moved back to the industry. So there are uh, the arrows could go either way, basically. Um, so specifically discussing about early career researchers um, and academia, what you can do within academia. Um, so you can be a postdoctoral research associate, uh, you usually work in such position in either um, a single or more than one but dedicated project. And you kind of usually have the downside of this is that you have fixed term contracts, so there's not too much job security. Uh, however, you can participate or write your own even research proposals and once you start to attra attract uh, a little bit of funding, uh, then you can become a research fellow and uh, all, or also you can follow the, let's say, um, uh, normal academic career path, which usually in the UK starts with a lecturer position. Um, in Europe and US, this is usually called an assistant professor um, and it goes all the way up to becoming a professor. Uh, the main activities, if, if someone can categorize them, is, is research, teaching, knowledge exchange, and citizenship, which has to do a lot with uh, administrative, managerial, and, and leadership roles, effectively. If you are inclined and if you like, really like teaching, you can also get a teaching-focused role, which is in the UK referred to as a teaching fellow, normally. Uh, and in, in most of those uh, positions, what you do is you do a lot of research. You can do the so-called blue sky or green fields or the more innovative, futuristic, let's say, uh, research. But you can also work with the uh, government to influence policy. You can work with industry to make real world impact. Uh, and you can collaborate with several research organizations, other groups, other universities, and obviously work a lot with uh, professional registration organizations. Um, so you can be involved in committees, working groups, uh, and so on, as Professor Zank also mentioned previously. Uh, so um, talking about, I'd like also to take a moment to talk about um, fellowships uh, specifically for early career researchers, as I am myself a UK Research and Innovation Future Leaders Fellow. And I think this is an excellent opportunity, especially for early career researchers because uh, this gives you, at the very early stage of your career, where you, you most need it, it gives you significant resources for equipment, for travel, to, to build a team, basically, which is the most important thing. And it's long-term, consistent, and continuous support, uh, which gives you, if you will, the luxury to focus on your research and, and make your research vision a reality. Uh, there are various schemes that one can apply for. Uh, research councils run various such schemes, the Royal Academy of Engineering as well. And there are several other individual organizations that um, have their own fellowships as well. Even, even individual universities have their own fellowship schemes. Um, you also get great opportunities to work with industrial partners, policy makers and so on and, and make real impact. The downside is that this is usually a competitive and long process, so it takes a lot of effort to apply for such positions. So that's a downside. Um, now, talking about benefits for, specifically from professional organizations such as IEEE, IT, SIGRE, and so on, I think one key thing that I found throughout my career that helped me a lot was uh, uh, the the enculturation, meaning becoming part of the culture of the research and academic community. So it exposes you in experiences, um, helps you engage with, to get to meet people that are at the various stages of their careers, such as, for example, this event that we're having um, here today. And you can also get involved with uh, so-called affinity groups. So for example, women in engineering or young, young professionals and so on. So I think this is a very important aspect um, while participating with professional organizations. Uh, obviously, you have the publications and other relevant resources, which helps you keep up to date with the state of the art, and also, of course, publish your own work. You get several magazines, uh, journals, you get online resources. Uh, for example, the, the PES Resource Center is, is a very good example of this. Um, for example, the IEEE PES General Meeting, which is the, the flagship IEEE conference, uh, international conference, so 
all the panel sessions will be available in the PES Resource Center for PES members for this year. So this is a very good opportunity to um, um, get some very good material. Um, conferences in general and tutorials, uh, apart from the technical content, I think the interaction with people is quite important. Uh, it's a very important aspect as well. And you also do get the benefit of getting a discount when you are attending a conference. Um, several other events apart from conferences such as the one that we're having today but more importantly i think it's a very good experience and opportunity to get involved with local uh, organizing committees and organize yourself or get involved in the organization of such events choose the speakers take the initiative uh, i think this is a unique opportunity and i would highly recommend that you take it um, you also have access to uh, recognize to top experts and speakers from all over the, the, the planet, effectively. So the ITPLE Distinguished Lecturer Program is, is an example of, of such a, a good opportunity. Uh, and then last but not least, you have also the working groups or ITPLE so-called task forces and technical committees where you get to interact with top experts in the field. And of course, you can also disseminate your own work as well. Um, this is just some, some additional material from IEEE PES uh, in case you want to follow up uh, for uh, in terms of benefits and how to join the, the uh, committees as well. And uh, these are my uh, And if you wish to follow up even after the event, feel free to, here's my email, my LinkedIn as well, feel free to connect. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Um, now let's have some questions. So the first question I received is asking about IET. So he asked whether IET is worth joining as well as IEEE and CGRE. Um, so we don't have any IET representative here. Um, the, uh, all the speakers are IET members, but they, they are not within any uh, like uh, administration committee. But uh, doctor, can you comment on this? Uh, well, personally, I am, as you mentioned, a member of the IET, and I am involved in, in, in a couple of committees uh, and one working group from the IET, and I do, found, uh, do find relevance and interest in those. This is why I'm part of it as well. So, I, short answer, yes. So, it would be worth um, um, joining IET as well. Um, yeah, that's, that's my opinion. I, I am involved in uh, Engineering Policy Group Scotland, which deals with policy matters uh, specifically for Scotland area. And I'm also involved in the Sustainable Planet Working Group, which is um, kind of a working group to, to, to give guidance to, to the IET leadership regarding one of the strategic themes, which is the Sustainable Planet. So yeah, I, I, do, I do find it interesting. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So IET is a UK based one and for anyone who's from the University of Manchester, I know that uh, for any undergraduates of the Department of AAA, you can get IET membership for free. So uh, make good use of it. Um, so another question is about the research fellowship. So a lot of people say that doing a postdoc after a PhD course is something that uh, it's not a permanent position it's a fixed term so is it is it the same for research fellowships as well so you ask for a funding and then after it ends then you like postdoc you have to uh, apply again for any other job positions uh, yeah so different schemes have very different um possibilities so uh, probably this is not a universal answer that i'm going to give but most of the times yes these are fixed term um, contracts if you will or positions so fellowships do have a specific duration attached to them usually and after the fellowship finishes it's usually up to you to let's say either get a permanent role um, or um, um, let's say, uh, be able to, to, to get a promotion, let's say, while you are still in your fellowship, which is, will lead you to a permanent position. So yes, there is, there is um, um, usually a um, fixed term um, duration of, of most fellowships. Mm 
Yes. But you can, that doesn't mean that, so you can also be in a permanent role. So for example, you can have a permanent academic role, uh, either lecturer or, or some fellowships even target a late career, even professors. And you can still get a fellowship while on your permanent role. So it's not very straightforward potentially, but uh, um, you, you can be in a permanent role and have a fellowship as well at the same time. Yes. But to, to, to become a fellow, do you have to uh, link with a certain university or research organization? Because I, I but, certainly understand that the fellowship is under your own name. Yes. Yeah. So do you have to, yeah. to like, uh, how, how do you uh, cooperate with a university then? Right. So you are usually hosted within an organization, which mm -hmm. can be a university or it can be even a company uh, regarding specific schemes. So the specific scheme that I'm, I, I have, mm -hmm. uh, you can be part of a, a company as well, if you will. So you can be hosted by a company. So effectively, uh, the host organization um, is where you basically work day to day and the funding body is some research council that yes. gives you that provides you the fellowship yes so yes. in my case is uk research and innovation is this kind of a compilation of all the research councils in the uk yes thank you for clarifying and it's actually a very good uh, pathway for any young researchers to think about and also we have a comment posted in the chat room uh, by Brian, and he mentioned that IET is a UK recognized engineering body. So if you want to, well, participate in the policy making, um, so it's well worth joining IET in the UK, definitely. Um, also, someone asked, what's the best way to find a funded PhD position after MSc course? Um, the best way, uh, well, I would say, so there are several websites where you can, you know, search for available positions. All universities or most universities at least have their own um, uh, search tools within, within their websites that you can find open available positions. Uh, so probably that might be a good initial uh, starting point. Um, IEEE has a, a global mailing list, which is called Power Glow, which is free for anyone to join. And a lot of academics usually post their positions there. So you can find a lot of information also in such mailing lists. Power Glow is just an example. There might be other ones as well. Um, and I would also say that uh, it, is, it would be a good idea to find out which research area you like. So what is the topic that you like? Find out a group, a research group that do uh, work that you like around that area and contact even the supervisors by yourself as well. Um, so yep. that would be a good starting point. Okay, thank you very much. Now let's move on to our next talk. So after hearing about two talks on the career pathways in academia, now let's say, uh, have a look at what opportunities are there in the industry. So now let's welcome uh, Dr. Stephanie Hay from TEI uh, Services. Doctor, are you online? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, love that to you. So Dr. Hay is director of the network and innovation team at TEI. She's a chartered engineer with 12 years of experience in the power industry. Um, uh, Due to the time, I'll let yourself to introduce uh, your own experience. Is that okay? Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, I'll switch the screen to you. Thank you. Let me just share it. Where are we? Um, one second. Um, oh, here we are. Oops. Can everyone see this? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for the introduction. My name is Stephanie. 
uh, and I am the Director of Networks and Innovation at TNEI Services. So we are a small consultancy um, with uh, specialists in energy and environment. So I'd, I'd first like to thank the, the CVNGN for inviting me to speak today. Um, a few of my team are active members of the NGN, including Dip Targa, who opened the session. Um, so I'm always happy to support them and, and those in the wider industry as well. I think um, this is a great event. Um, I'm really encouraged that so many of you are already thinking about chartership. It's definitely a marathon, is what I would say, rather than a sprint. And I think it really helps to start preparing for it as, as early in your career. Uh, as possible so that you can progress with this in mind um, and I also think it can be really beneficial in understanding how anything that you do can be applied to the chartership competencies and that these cover much more than just your technical expertise so obviously your technical expertise is a hugely important aspect but the value of the other areas so stuff like project and people management commercial and contractual arrangements, um, health and safety. Um, I think the value and the importance of these can't, can't be overlooked. So I think this afternoon, I, I just wanted to take you through my career and my chartership journey um, in the hopes that you might find, and find something useful for your own. Um, so I'll talk briefly about my career and how it has progressed from my undergraduate degree. I'll talk briefly about my career and how um, how that's translated into my chartership uh, and then some of the benefits that the chartership has for me specifically as a consultant. Um, I'd then like to talk, you, talk to you about the interview itself because I actually found that to be the area with the least information available on what to actually expect. So there's obviously a ton of information available on the IT website for the application and the competencies and the interview, but I just wanted to share my experience as a little additional context in that specific area. So I only got my CNG towards the end of last year, so I think it was September time in 2019. So I'd really just like to impart a little bit of wisdom and practical experience from the process while, while it's still reasonably fresh in, in my head. Um, so I started off, my, I did my master's and my PhD in electronic and electrical engineering at Strathclyde University in Glasgow. So I, I, w I was in sort of university education from around 2002 to 2011. And from there, I moved on to consultancy. So I started, my first job was as a power systems engineer, which was a consultant role at Mott McDonald in their transmission and distribution team in Glasgow. So I was there for about two and a half years. Um, and I left there in 2014 to join TNEI as a senior consultant. And I did that for around four years before being promoted to principal consultant and uh, team lead of the networks and innovation team um, in 2018. So again, I did that for about two years and then we had a bit of a, a management restructure and I am now the director of networks and innovation. Um, and I've been in that position for just under a year now. So I think it'll be November time, it'll be a year. Um, and I'm also director of TNI Ireland, which is a, a, a company that we incorporated late last year to better serve our, our Irish clients. So we do the same thing in Ireland as we do in the UK, but it, it's always helpful to have some local presence. Um, so I'm, I'm helping to drive that as well. So as you can probably see, I've, I've always been a consultant and this isn't necessarily where I saw myself at university, but I have been doing it now for almost nine years and, and I do really enjoy it. And what I like most about it is the variety. So no two days of mine are the same, no two projects are the same. And, you know, I have managed to progress quite quickly to director level. And this has happened quite organically with, with the company. We're quite a small organisation and we've had a few changes. So um, that, that's sort of where I am now. So just to talk to you about the... the how the how this chartership and the CN just is factored into to that that sort of journey. So I started thinking seriously about applying for the CN when I joined TNEI. Now the CN is typically in the career plan for most engineers, or at least most engineers that I've come across, and it's a way to really 
prove that you've progressed since university and you're working at a certain skill level and competency. Um, this isn't something you need to wait until you've got 20 years of experience to do, but equally it's not something to underestimate either. So it really took me some time and effort to understand what the requirements were and how my experience aligned with those. And I found initially that the consultancy aspect quite tricky to understand. So how can consultancy projects meet some of these competencies when they're talking about products and systems? How, how does that apply to me and what I do? So it's actually all about context. So on a daily basis, I deal with project delivery, project management, resourcing and budgeting, um, commercial arrangements and contracts, line management, business development, marketing, training, strategy, and a whole host of other things. And as I say, I struggled at first to grasp how to translate that consultancy work into the CNG competencies, but it turns out it's actually really easy um, if you just consider all of the things that I just listed there that I do day to day. Um, so some of, the, some of the benefits for a consultant to have a CNG really lie in the way we bid for projects. So it's really beneficial to demonstrate the caliber of the teams and the people that we're putting forward to these projects and these assignments. And it really gives our clients a sense of comfort to know that their projects are in good hands. International projects are a big one. So the organizations like the World Bank or the Asian Development Bank um, really look for engineers with a lot of experience and a chartership qualification. Um, and it's, it's, it's also a great personal achievement um, in your career as well. So as I said, I got, I got my qualification in 2019, so it's, it's taken me probably a, the better part of a decade <laughs> to actually get around to doing it, but we got there in the end. So in terms of the interview, I, I really wanted to just talk about this because this, as I say, this was one of the things that I, it was quite a surprise to me and it was quite, it was quite a change of mindset when, when it actually came to doing it. So um, a very important point about the interview that you do have to do a presentation and being an engineer, like most of you probably are, you're very used to presenting technical content, justification, reasoning, results, and how you got to those results. But this is not the point of this interview. The interviewers aren't interested or they're not assessing the technical content of a specific project you've been working on. What they are assessing is how you executed that project in relation to the competency. So how did you apply sound engineering principles and judgment? How did you plan the project? Um, and how did you ensure it was implemented on time and on budget? How did you communicate the results? And through this, did you comply with health and safety regulations and all of that sort of stuff? So it's important to really adjust your mindset for, for this interview in particular. And just to bear in mind, you've probably already covered most of the technical stuff and the management aspect in your application itself. So really take some time to make sure you've brushed up on some of the other less glamorous areas like ethics and codes of conduct and stuff like that. So this, this was actually one of the slides that I used in my interview. So I kept it quite simple, but also nice and colourful. Um, so in terms of picking a project to present, um, as you can imagine, working in consultancy, it's very fast paced and I have a multitude of projects that I could pick from. Uh, and I could probably chat for days on any one of them, but I did pick one that really encompassed all of the competencies and demonstrated the level that I perform at. So the particular study that I presented was a medium voltage DC technology study that we, t and I, were commissioned to do back in 2015 um, for Scottish Enterprise and SP Energy Networks. And for this particular project, I worked on the proposal. I project managed the project itself. We had some sub-consultants involved in there who had to be managed. Um, there was contractual and commercial negotiations. There was resourcing, budgeting, and quality assurance as well. Um, and then obviously within the project, there were the technical aspects and the reporting. Um, and the presentation uh, really showed the, the competency and communications that you need. So it really had everything that I, 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 I was looking for to, to be able to showcase my, my skill level across the board. 
Um, I was also able to show how the outcomes of this project progressed further beyond that individual project, both for myself um, in my career and for the industry. So the initial work that we did on the study eventually progressed over a series of subsequent projects into a network innovation competition funded project by Ofgem. So it's the Angle DC project, if anyone wants to look it up. Um, we then also had the right experience to carry out more similar work for another client. Um, I also wrote and presented a paper on the findings of the study at the CGA Paris session back in 2016. Um, I was also invited to speak at the IET ACDC conference and give a keynote address in 2017. And finally, I continued to win and deliver similar projects for various clients. So for me, using this project and everything that came from it was a really great way to package up all of the evidence for the competencies quite neatly. Um, obviously, not everyone will be able to do this, but I'd, I'd at least advise you to think about it. Think about what you've done that covers a good chunk of the required skills and, and present them as, as a sort of unified, um, unified um, application. So just my last slide here, what, what I've learned for the process. Um, so I would, first of all, save yourself a ton of time and stress by keeping your career manager up to date. I really can't stress this point enough. Um, it will save you a massive headache if you keep on top of things. Even when I started using my career manager, I had already amassed a whole load of things to add to it and, and it really took some time. So thinking back to conferences, seminars, training and other events that I'd been doing um, while I was studying for my PhD and even in Mott McDonald's. So I had to dig out old conference notes and, and other such things. So I, I would that would be my, my number one recommendation. Uh, I'd also recommend um, a mentor. So the target was talking earlier about the, the mentorship program with the NGN. I think that's a great idea. Um, or even a colleague who's gone through the process recently to, to help you out and really just contextualize, contextualize your work um, to, to the competencies. So as I mentioned previously, I, I struggled a bit initially to understand how the consultancy experience could be contextualized. But speaking to my old manager really helped me understand it. Um, and this person will also be able to point out things for you that you maybe don't realize are relevant or that you haven't thought of. Um, so get, get, that, get that second opinion. Um, another key thing is you definitely don't need to be an expert in everything before you apply. I will caveat that by saying you do need to be a practitioner level for all competencies as per the guidelines, but uh, you don't. You definitely don't need to be an expert. And if you wait to be an expert in everything, you could be probably waiting a while. Um, so yeah, just just going back to my my previous point about the interview. So don't don't treat it like any other presentation. You, as I say, you've probably already covered much of the technical stuff in your application, um, and there will be a real focus on the competencies that you perhaps haven't covered as well, like codes of conduct and ethics. Um, the, the last point I'd want to make just before I finish up is to just enjoy it. Um, so if you've gotten to the interview, then you've already proven that you're working at the necessary level for chartership. Um, the interviewers really just want to confirm this. Um, and they, the interviewers sort of sign up to, to be these assessors because they're genuinely interested in learning about different areas of expertise other than their own. So the, the, the two guys who interviewed me, one, one was a, a power systems engineer, but the other, I think he worked in aviation. So he was really interested in MVDC technology and its application. So um, it, it does give them insight into different areas of engineering that, that aren't their specialty. So if, if, you're, if you go in there and you're enthusiastic, it'll, it'll come through and, and you'll do well. So that's all that I have to say for now. I hope you found something useful in there and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much. So let me check if there are any questions. So, so we are running out of time. So would you mind that I combine the question and answer sessions with Dr. Kong? Not at all, not at all. Yeah, okay, now let's um, just hurry to uh, welcome Dr. Kong to give us uh, a presentation 
on a career path and the uh, industry as well. So Dr. Kong is an, a set life cycle engineer from national grid electricity transmission. Um, and again, I'll leave it to you self to introduce uh, your own experience. And Doctor, I'll uh, hand over the screen to you. Okay, thanks, Claire. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I can share my screen with you. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for giving me this opportunity to for this presentation on the career path in industry and the chairmanship. And uh, this is the uh, I'm Dr. Kong from National Grid Electricity Transmission, uh, which is the electricity transmission owner in England and Wales in the UK and uh, uh, compared with other presenters, uh, my story would be relatively simple. Uh, I left academia in 2012 and then joined uh, National Grid Electricity Transmission and get in 2013 uh, as a young professional I started my career in power industry as a technology application engineer in NDET. And uh, since 2013, I have been heavily getting involved in new technology, innovation, engineering, and the whole life cycle management for transmission assets in NDET system. Uh, after more than eight years practice in power industry. I have developed my subject matter expertise in two technical areas. One is the power electronics, because Professor John touched upon power electronics uh, include uh, emerging and start of art, uh, actually DC technologies and uh, flex technologies. The another strength for me is the protection and control. Uh, uh, for my short-term uh, objective to become a chartered engineer, I have achieved in 2018. Uh, it's a kind of the milestone for me. And uh, however, I am still striving for my short-term aspiration uh, to become a technical leader and the specification in those two areas uh, with influence and reputation in the global power industry. Because uh, another uh, presentation touched upon the, uh, some organizations, so I want to extend more to introduce my engagement, particularly in Sigri, uh, say uh, what Sigri supported me for my short-term and long-term aspiration and the chartership application. Uh, I initially become a Sigrid UK's uh, next generation networks member for, uh, from academia in 2010. And that time I was a student at the Birmingham University. Uh, currently, I'm a very active member in two Sigrid study communities. One, uh, two of them are in line with my current expertise. One is the E4, is DC systems and power electronics. And E5 is protection and automation. Uh, I was voted for the UK's regular member in secret B4 staff committee in 2020 to 2022. And at the end of August, this, uh, this summer, uh, I think so. If everyone have interest to for the B4 study committee, and uh, uh, I'm very open. You can have some discussion with me. Because uh, 
many commentators have touched upon what's the benefit, what's the driver for the chartership. Uh, I think for personally for different people that have different views, but I think the three key benefits, first of all, you can be widely recognized within your communities, not only your companies, but, uh, but also regional and international professionals, professionals as professional based on the evidence of your competence, experience, and the commitment. In doing so, you can influence and inspire others in your communities based on your such uh, rec uh, recognitions and achievements. It can help improve your career prospects with tangible positive outcomes. For example, you could have more career opportunities and a higher salary. Uh, uh, and because uh, uh, another street presentation touched upon the chartered engineer, uh, according to my experience in the in the in my company, uh, chartered engineer is not the only option. You can select the the appropriate route fit for your purpose. It depends on you. Aligned with your short, short and long term career aspirations, current job responsibilities, your strengths, your parents' experience, your enthusiasm, and so on. For example, if you have ambition to demonstrate, deeply demonstrate your leadership, you can apply for the chartered manager. If you, if you kind of role for project manager or quality manager or risk manager, you can apply for the chartership in other chartered institutions for the equivalent role status like a charter engineer. Uh, if you are looking after procurement and supply, you, you could consider the charter status in procurement and supply. And another question that if you have interest as a research, the research you can consider the charter mathematician, physics, and the scientist as as your aspiration for the uh, chartership. As, as I mentioned, my long-term aspiration is to become a technical spe specialist and a technical leader. So I definitely, I select route for the engineering and the technology. And uh, I'm also in the power industry. So the IET would be the most appropriate route for me. And uh, so what's the, how to achieve this charter qualification via the IET route? A person, different people share different uh, experience, but according to the competence framework uh, from the IET website, you can, it's a quick summary of the five key aspects. First one is how to, uh, is your knowledge and uh, understanding of your engineering, innovation, and uh, technology and uh, innovation. Second thing is that how to demonstrate your problem solving skills and uh, and how to demonstrate some soft skills like your uh, project management, interpersonal skills, and uh, commercial awareness for the for the specific uh, engineering aspects. So you can find uh, more details from the link I given in this website. Uh, but if you, for another subject, for example, if your subject is mechanical engineering or civil engineering, you can select another chartered institutions for your future chartership application and uh, inter interview. I applied the, the link here, so if you have interest, you can have dig out more. Because uh, my colleague Deep introduced us uh, some benefits of of joining uh, UK's uh, secret NGN. Uh, one of them is uh, it could be a very useful and a supportive way for professional development and route to chartership. I totally agree with that. And uh, I can share some experience of my engagement in the secret. Uh, this is a quick, uh, quick intro 
action of the CIGRI, because the CIGRI is the global community for the collaborative uh, development and share of a power system expert, expertise from volunteers around the world. It's a, it's a global community to work together towards the new challenges and the new opportunities uh, for the power industry in the world. And uh, I understand that for most of the audience here could be the young professionals or young researchers. So I totally raise deep that Secret UK NGM could be a starting point to, to explore your career path and also it's chance to give you support for your chartership application. And um, it can broaden your vision and shift insight into the engineering technology and the innovation in power system uh, from the secret comprehensive conference, for example, the every session on a biannual basis is a very, very organized event in the world, and some knowledge sharing events like this co uh, this webinar organized by secret NGN and HBPS, and site visit, for example, is the Western Link visit, the Allstone Great VSC actually DC demonstrator visit. It's really impressive. When I was a student, I visit this uh, VSC actually DC uh, demonstrator. It's really, it was really, really impressive. I was inspired by this kind of the new technology. That's the reason I still try to be a very active member in the power electronics society for the HVDC and the power electronics development. And, the, and the you can, uh, as the young member, we encourage you to join our working group to make your voice louder. I hope no matter with your background, I just see our way which can share opportunity. You join us, you support us. It help you to shape your insight and uh, help you understand what is the opportunity and the challenges for different specific working groups of different communities. And uh, as I mentioned, it would be a really good opportunity, a good society to link with subject matter experts and professional from industry like utilities, uh, supplies and consultants and academia organizations and follow another good practice like uh, touch on some key uh, aspects for project solving, uh, problem solving, project management and interpersonal skills, particularly some and communication with different levels where your overall and verbal communications as well as the professional standards and uh, I think this is a good opportunity you can share with your expertise and build your own reputation with this global community. So that could be a really, really quick uh, presentation for me due to the, due to the limiting time. And uh, thanks for your time. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to let me know. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, Doctor, for uh, the speech. It's very interesting to know that uh, uh, when we first talk about the chartered uh, engineering, where we first think about the own uh, power and energy industry, but uh, you showed us that there are actually more to explore. So I received uh, a question. Um, so Zong asked, uh, in, are you uh, eligible to have multiple chartships? For example, um, if one chartership uh, recognized in a particular country but is not in the others. So Dr. Kong and Dr. Hay, do you have any comments on this question? Uh, I believe that you can have multiple ones. Um, I don't know too much about it, but one of my colleagues from um, South Africa had asked me the same question. So I, I believe he's chartered um, 
with whatever body it is in, in South Africa, but he had asked if it was possible for him to do the IET one to be sort of chartered, I guess, in, in the UK. Um, and, and the answer is yes, you can do it if, if, if you have the, the impetus to, to want to do it multiple times, for sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, some comment from me. I definitely think IET would be kind of international, international regularized uh, uh, You can go to different uh, chartered institutions, say uh, uh, what kind of region it can cover. It can cover. I understand in Northern America, they could have a different chartered system. Okay, thank yeah. you. It's, it's case by case, I think. Mm. Yeah, um, at least uh, one of the uh, audience say it's accepted. Um, the chartered and, and uh, uh, chartership from IET is accepted in North America, uh, and it's it's true that it's uh, widely uh, recognized worldwide. Um, another question is, um, what's the opportunity? Uh, that been opened up after you became a uh, chartered engineer. So Dr. Kong, you mentioned that there will be um, uh, more uh, position opportunities and also higher salary uh, potentially. So um, can you please give us an example from you or your colleagues and also uh, from Dr. Hay as well? Like uh, what sort of job position uh, requires uh, you example, to be a chartered? Uh, maybe you, you can dig out more when you uh, apply for some job role. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, according to the scope of work, say a uh, chartership or equipment is required for this job role, particularly for mm -hmm. some senior senior uh, staff role. <laughs> yeah, I think I think I would I would agree with that. So. Yeah. For for me personally, I was um, I didn't get a promotion as a result of my chartership, but it certainly didn't hurt the situation. But I think in um, in some of the some organisations, you know, it's a prerequisite for some senior level roles to have a chartership. So I think internally, definitely, there is the opportunity to progress as well as you know for for something on your CV if you're if you're applying for new jobs, um, and it does like it does allow you to think more internationally because the CNG is accepted um, across. Um, across the, glo the globe and in, in various areas as well. So there are more international opportunities, I would say, as well. Okay, thank you. And a specific question for Dr. Hay. So how did TNEI support you, uh, support you to achieve the chartership? Um, so, well, they, they definitely did support me. Um, it was on my appraisal form for about four years, I think, before I actually managed to do it and get it off there. Um, so there was always a lot of support and encouragement for um, for the process. Um, my old boss, uh, Rachel, she became my mentor um, and she talked me through the process. She had only recently got chartered as well, so she had some really useful insights as well. Um, t and &E pay for our professional registration, so there was obviously the cost benefit there as well. Um, so I didn't have to pay for the interview or anything. So, so yeah, they're, they're, they're very supportive. And I think um, because of the, the benefits to consultancy, like I was saying in my presentation, um, it allows us to put forth a strong team. If we've got chartered engineers, it allows us to win more work. It, it's really a value to the company as well as the individual. So I think a lot of the, the certainly the consultancy organisations do, do support the, the, the application and the process in, in a similar way. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we don't have any more questions, but uh, as our speakers has, have kindly agreed to be in touch later. So, um, so I guess that's the end of our webinar. Thank you for all the speakers to give your uh, excellent speech. I, uh, I have listed the uh, social media and websites for both uh, IEEE Power and Energy Society Student Branch Chapter and also Sigri UK NGN here in case you need it. And I would like to ask all attendees before you leave, can you please uh, fill in this feedback form to give um, 
it will take less than one minute or you can just scan the QR code and to uh, directly go to the feedback form. I also posted in the chat room. Um, I will try to post the, the video recording of today's webinar within three days. So keep an eye on our YouTube channel. Otherwise, thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thanks. Thank Bye. you.